Hi, everyone. Uh, I know it's a difficult time to have class and, and uh, everyone's sort of struggling with the news a bit. Um, I am too. And as I said in class today, I'm hoping that our observing some of the routine rituals of the semester uh, can be a bit of a comfort. And so we have our reading tonight in that spirit and hope you enjoy it. I'm gonna do a short intro for Isabel Hamad and then she's gonna read and then we'll have questions in the usual way. Uh, Isabella Hamad was born in London and obtained her undergraduate degree in English from Oxford. In 2012, she was awarded a Kennedy Scholarship to Harvard. She was at Harvard briefly. And then in 2013, she uh, received a Harperwood Creative Writing Studentship from Cambridge uh, and later got her MFA at NYU where she worked on The Parisian, the novel that we've read. Um, she won the Plimpton Prize from the, Par from the Paris Review for her story, Mr. Canaan in 2018. The novel followed in 2019, won quite a few awards, including from the American, American Academy of Arts and Letters. Um, and really, there's sort of one sentence to say about this book that I've been wont to say in public, and that is, it's one of the finest and most ambitious novels to appear in English in the last generation in scale, form, and tone and a major, major contribution to fiction writing from the tradition and the culture of Palestine. So we're really lucky to have Isabella Hamad here today. Please welcome her, Isabella Hamad. Thank you all for, um, for joining. Um, it's a real honor to be with you virtually. Um, and thank you for coming on such a a difficult day, um, but we're not going to, there's a little respite from that, I hope. So um, I'm going to read to you a little bit from a novel I'm working on, um, which doesn't actually have a title or it has had many titles, um, but to give you a little introduction, um, the it's set in 2017 uh, in London and Palestine. Um, the main character is the narrator, her name is Sonia. She's an actress and she's 39. And uh, she's gone to visit her sister in Haifa uh, and has got roped into a production of Hamlet there. And she's playing Gertrude and Ophelia currently. Um, the, the director's name is Mariam and the guy playing Hamlet is, uh, is called Wa'al Hijazi. He's a famous singer, not an actor. Um, and the other thing to know is that a fidei is um, uh, is a Palestinian or a freedom fighter or somebody engaged in armed struggle um, and Palestinian Fedayeen um, were mainly training in Jordan in, in camps uh, in the late 60s and 70s. Just to you know, orient you. Okay, this is from chapter nine. We had five weeks until opening night. The solace and the sadness of a play with a limited run is this, that you can trace the arc of progress in advance. Like entering a love affair you know will end, we recklessly enjoyed the highs while they lasted and valiantly endured the things that were difficult, for they too would pass. There'd be two weeks of performances in Bethlehem and then I'd fly back to London where classes above the pub would resume in September and auditions would trickle in, hopefully. The theatre had settled its debts with both the Palestinian Authority and the Israelis and the electricity was working again, but we didn't rehearse there every day. Since several of our performances would be open air, we continued to use Mariam's garden on days when it wasn't too hot to accustom ourselves to projecting without microphones. And when it was too hot and the theatre was booked, we used an empty room at a cultural centre down the road. Ibrahim found a flat to rent with Ferris for two months while I slept in Mariam's spare room which meant that I could enter the backstage area of the tree shadows on the garden rehearsal days with my hair loose and a coffee in hand, while not in a literal gut nightgown, yet with the air of coming straight from bed, a Gertrude come Lady Macbeth, while the boys, as Mariam and I took to calling them, were warming up on the lawn. 
Our solution to the problem of Gertrude and Ophelia was this. We would film Ophelia's dialogue in Act 4 and I, as Gertrude, would address myself as Ophelia on a screen. The drowning would also be projected, a larger than life body floating on a stretched canvas above the stage, rolling in water with debris and flowers. We played some familiar games with the script, improvising scenes that weren't there, including a seduction scene between me and Claudius, in which we accentuated Gertrude's guilt. A scene where Rosencrantz and Guildenstern discussed Hamlet's madness, a youthful love scene between Ophelia and Hamlet from before his father dies, and another after his father has died, but before he has seen the ghost. Marianne vetoed attempting the scene of the murder because Merged was both Claudius and the ghost of old Hamlet and she didn't want anyone to be a stand-in. We recited Hamlet's soliloquies as an ensemble, looping them into murderous incantations. We recited the ghost's lines together until we were all ghosts, all booming it, Wael, and then we passed the lines between us like a ball, repeating them in a circle with Wael as the eye, every voice distinct, and for the particular actor whose speeches we had commandeered, these exercises showcased a range of possible intonations and meanings, and as a group they rallied our animal sensitivities to one another. They also had a visible effect on Wael, who looked, I must say, increasingly haunted. The detention of Salim Mansour remained in the local press alongside the attempts to demolish a village in the Jordan Valley where a group of foreign activists had stationed themselves. It became public knowledge that the treason of which Salim was accused was, as Mariam had conjectured, his involvement in arts funding in the Palestinian territories. Nevertheless, the idea that he was financing terrorism continued to hold currency in the Israeli press, which mined the allegation to discredit other Palestinian members of the Knesset. Official sources and newspapers alike claimed that Salim's coordination with the Palestinian Authority, not only to fund his sister's production, but to improve infrastructure for the arts across the West Bank and Gaza, with the aim of welcoming more international artists, as well as nurturing homegrown talent, classified as cooperation with people who desired the destruction of the Israeli state and was therefore treasonous. That this flew hard in the face of the fact that, ever since the beginning of the interminable peace process in the 90s, the Israeli state itself had been coordinating with this same terrorist organization in order to delegate their occupation of the West Bank to Palestinian security forces, none of the major outlets remarked upon, but all the major Arab activists on Twitter loudly pointed out. Although, given the way the internet worked, and that most comments on these posts appeared to come from trolls or other activists, or occasional bystanders keen to share their opinions on the topics of peace, terrorism, and brotherly love, this was largely a case of preaching to the deaf and to the choir. At least it's good publicity, we said. More than half the articles on the subject used a photograph of Wael smiling with microphone in hand, sometimes a picture of Wael beside a picture of Salim, sometimes pointing out that they were cousins, and sometimes they also used images of peripheral PLO members in their youths as fighters, dressed in military garb with Kalashnikovs and long sideburns. Some articles even named the dates of the principal performances in Bethlehem, and it was only a shame that they didn't also share a link to the production website. Nothing is more flattering to an artist than the illusion that he is a secret revolutionary. These public developments created a feeling among the cast that we were, in fact, preparing ourselves on a revolutionary training base for an operation with a transcendental goal, that in combing our translated lines for subtext, we were fighting the odds in the name of Palestinian freedom. Amin's air of melancholy conviction became more pronounced, and during our smoke breaks, I watched him glancing at the ground or distant buildings or the sky, gazing apparently on nothing, gazing really on himself. I noticed it in Barahim too, who despite my efforts not to, I paid close attention to, and in Jihad, both of them becoming more ardent, more alert on those mornings when a new article about us popped up on their Facebook feeds. The pressure affected Wa'el negatively. Many of Mariam's exercises were devoted, directly or indirectly, to helping him access something new in his character, or calming him down, or assisting him with his lines. Sometimes I felt like taking him aside and saying, you know what, Well, it actually doesn't matter how convincing you are as Hamlet. The more important thing is that you are in the play, and everyone loves you and will come to see you, and once they have seen you, they will continue to love you, or will love you even more. But the truth was, I wasn't sure everyone did love him. The atmosphere of light competition that I had sensed at the start of rehearsals, for which I held Amin initially responsible, 
had been taken up by jihad and even, disappointingly, Ibrahim, and tainted with scorn. Most malice can be traced to jealousy, but explanations are not antidotes. Whether Maryam detected it was unclear. The symptoms were so mild, he needed to be watching closely to catch them in the grain of their everyday interactions, warm-ups, transitions, breaks, mealtimes, goodbyes, a reluctance to include Wa'el, an avoidance of eye contact, a note of exasperation. I wondered if this didn't represent a microcosm of Wa'el's larger presence in the Palestinian imaginary, which I was beginning to grasp also had its darkness, contempt being the flip side of envy. The heat that first week was intense and at Mariam's insistence, I plastered myself with sun cream on the days we spent in the garden, although I already had a healthy color. On Tuesday, Ibrahim looked me full in the face, sneering and wiped a blob of cream from my nose. We worked through the entire play and from start to finish, Wa'el played up Hamlet's angst with a teenage greenness that was a familiar, if not particularly profound interpretation of the character. Mariam was not pleased. She wanted something harder and darker. Eventually, and influenced perhaps by the media fueled revolutionary mood, she instructed him explicitly to pretend he was a fidei. This was pitching for some of the deepest waters of Wa'el's psyche. We all knew one of his uncles had died in the War of the Camps and another fought in Jordan before Black September. As with the other exercises, we did it together first, around a physical training, jumping over flaming logs, rolled up yoga mats, with loaded guns in hand, mimed, a game of limbo that transformed into crawling under low-lying barbed wire, then an off-duty scene in our camp, smoking cigarettes and scarfing rations. Amin wanted to smoke for real. Mariam said, no, you did a gun without a real gun. You can do a cigarette. Then we ran through Act 4. Hamlet has killed Polonius, hidden the body, and now thwarts Claudius' attempt to have him ex executed. We sat on the floor with our backs against the walls, legs crossed or splayed, sipping from water bottles, in a mood of anticipation. A window was open to let in some fresh air, as well as the noise of rapid gunfire, from a wedding celebration or from some action in one of the camps. We rose to our feet as the scenes required, thinking less of our own lines than of where else, watching his fidei infused Hamlet for new convincing signs of the psychic mutilation of someone who has just committed murder and is speaking in riddles. I knew it would not be an easy fix. Still, I was hoping for progress. But Wael's fidei had no darkness at all. He was a blank, sincere warrior, pure of intention, unburdened by mortality, his own or that of others. The body is with the king, but the king is not with the body, he said, without irony or ambiguity as the repeating orders from a higher in command. He was not a living fidei facing death, but rather as one already dead, a fidei of the imagination, idealized, glorified, untouched by mortal fear because already immortalized into a symbol. His antic disposition came over as mild frustration, manifesting as ordinary adolescent sarcasm. In a manner quite different to her usual directorial mode, Mariam called everything to a stop before Ophelia had even finished doling out her flowers. Wael, she said, I need you to be more mad. Mad, said Wael, mad. He massaged his temples like a stage magician. Then abruptly he brightened. I think I'm worn out for the day, he said simply. Ibrahim met my eyes, thrusting his hands into his pockets and pulling them apart so that his tracksuit bottoms looked like clown trousers. Wael poured water from the drinks table into a cup, avoiding looking at anyone. I felt sorry for him. That evening, after collecting Emil from nursery and setting him before the TV, Mariam said, I wonder if I've made a mistake. Perhaps I should have given the part to Amin. I can't do this the whole way, turn my rehearsal room into a one-man drama school. It's not going to come all at once, I said, in what I thought was a reassuring tone, which was really my teaching voice. The next day was Thursday. In the morning after the warm-up, Mariam announced, with a performance of composure, as though it were all part of a larger design, Today, Wael, you're going to be an Israeli soldier. When was the last time you were at a checkpoint and some soldier was a real asshole to you? Wael dropped a bright white grin. Think of the rudest, cruelest Israeli soldier. Now be that. There were a few laughs. Ibrahim cracked his knuckles. Amin looked trepidatious, jihad gleeful. Presumably all of them summoning the primordial image of the Israeli as he existed in the occupied Palestinian mind. Young, insolent, cruel, bored, armed. But Mariam stopped our imaginations in their tracks by saying, no, only Wa'el is doing it this time. This was the game. Wa'el is a soldier and we are passing through his checkpoint. 
She instructed Wael to choose a Jewish name and to keep it to himself. Then he left the room and we shuffled into a line, getting ready to go to work or to visit our relatives, fiddling with our IDs and permits. Mariam gave the signal and the soldier entered. Sometimes theatre can bleed into real life. It's for this reason that on-screen lovers fall in love and break up shortly after the film's premiered. The actors get muddled with their parts. It has happened to me a few times in my career, most memorably when I played Martirio in the house of Bernardo Alba at the Arcola. Bernardo Alba is one of those plays that are well known for bleeding. The woman playing Adela, Rosaline her name, and I hated each other so much that we criticized each other's performances continually. I was always snarking on the inflexibility of her rehearsal style, the way she minced certain words, and undoubtedly she said awful things about me, and eventually the cast settled into two camps which fortified our rivalry, so that it took a strenuous effort to remind ourselves that this was an effect of bleeding and not a true antagonism. After the final performance, we had a long cathartic laugh about it. Once you understand that a play is bleeding, it's like dreaming and understanding you are in a dream. The knowledge can endow you with supernatural power. You can use it to your advantage. But if you don't catch on until it's too late, bleeding can be destructive, depending on the play, of course. Bleeding can happen in the rehearsal room too, and that day, when Wa'al entered as the soldier, the atmosphere in the room shifted. I felt it in my chest at once, a falling. He walked to his sentry post, which was a chair balanced on a wood block. We, in our line, began to play at our humiliation, the routine turning through the styles of Hollandia, waiting for the light to go green, stuck when it turned red, which Wael choreographed by jabbing his finger on an invisible button. He awaited us with a bored expression. Ibrahim went first. He became a sullen, resentful youth, some version of his young self, I imagined, passing his bag and his shoes through the x-ray machine, shaking off his watch. The soldier stared at him. And then, once Wa'al had let Ibrahim pass, he called him back again, addressing him in Hebrew-accented Arabic. He took another look at Ibrahim's document, typed something into his computer, made an inaudible phone call. He dismissed him and jabbed the button. My turn. I faced Wa'al in his booth and marveled at his blankness. This was far more sinister than the boredom of the off-duty Fidei. He looked relaxed, perfectly still, watching me. The effect was unnerving and I played upon feeling unnerved. And at the same time, with a double vision of the performing artist, I could sense the waves of triumph radiating out from the corner of the room where Mariam was standing. Thank fuck, she said as we walked home. I knew he had it in him. I knew it was there. I'm like Michelangelo with a big lump of rock. Mariam's arrogance was becoming endearing to me because it was coupled with her straightforwardness. I would have said she seemed unscathed, were it not that the longer I stayed in her house, the more I understood how much she had suffered. It was rather as though, through all the twists and turns, she had managed to cling on to some innocence. As a director, she was chameleon-like. A hard leader who turned abruptly maternal, became innocently questioning, a confidant, a therapist, a manipulator, a sibyl. She spoke with her hands, plucking ideas from the air. The boys revered and rolled their eyes at her in equal measure, impersonating the way she said, pause, with her hand slightly bent, held out before her and gently lowered as though knighting someone. For me, working with her felt like being a student again. There was something helplessly amdram about the whole affair, with our seriousness always at risk of being punctured and our primary rehearsal space being our director's front garden, hidden from the road by trees, but surely audible to passers by. Also, Mariam believed more sincerely than most London practitioners I knew in a real conduit between art and politics. At the same time, she freely applied her cynical tongue to the cultural life of Ramallah, which does not, she emphasized, represent the West Bank. Although to Palestinians visiting from Haifa and Jaffa, in which I included myself, it seemed wild enough with its mixture of rubble and construction patrolled by mangy cats. The audiences here were mostly bourgeois and Christian, she said disparagingly even though this was a description of her own background. One night she extemporized upon the broad, broader risk that art might deaden resistance by softening suffering's blows through representing it. I said this was an easy statement to make when you were a citizen of a nation that granted you some of the taxpayers' privileges, even if not all of them. In any case, I wasn't sure it was true. Let them enjoy their art. What was the harm? And let them eat cake, said Mariam. Listen, you need to understand. And as she said this, she was trimming her hair over the bathroom sink, wetting it with her fingers and then combing with her left hand to extend the curls and snip 
a black curl fell and expanded on the white porcelain. And addressing me in the mirror, she went on to explain her theory, which she presented as truth, that when you read a novel about the occupation and feel understood, or watch a film and feel seen, your anger, which is like a wound, is dressed for a brief time and you can go on enduring a bit more easily. And so time goes on running like an open faucet and each film at the cultural center ends and we applaud as the credits roll with the lists of crests of institutional donors like great European aristocratic families of old. And while there are moments in these concerts and poetry readings and lectures and plays when you might feel connected to the other people in the room, to the people behind the screen, you might feel a kind of flowering in the chest at this sight of your community's resistance embalmed in art, some beauty created out of despair. All of this means that in the end, you, or at least the middle classes, are less likely to fight the fight because despair has been relieved momentarily. And perhaps our Hamlet would be just another version of this narcotic. And what, if anything, could we do about that? I laughed. Fatigue stops people fighting, not theatre. Did you know that in the old days, she went on, when Mustafa al-Kurd used to perform, the audience would leave the auditorium and immediately go out to the streets and demonstrate. Did you know that? That would never happen nowadays. Mariam was battling herself, I could see that. She didn't really think art was bad for resistance. She wanted me to supply the counter argument because the counter argument was what she wanted to believe. She ran her finger around the sink to collect the black threads she had snipped, washed them down, then reached robotically for the broom with no emotion on her face as she swept the floor. Fundamentally, Mariam lacked frivolity. Her needs were too buried. She herself was too needed by politics, by motherhood. My lightness felt grotesque in comparison. I was even by now starting to detect in her a maternal sensitivity to me. That, for example, she knew and appreciated I had abandoned my pride by joining her play which might mean that her reverence for my working life in, London, in the UK was, if not a performance, at least exaggerated to soothe my ego. It saddened me that she might think I required soothing, but perhaps I did require it. On Friday, we were supposed to leave Ramallah at 8 a.m. We left at half past with a bag of bread and a punnet of washed figs. Mariam had a funding meeting in Haifa to which she was bringing Wa'al and Ibrahim as representatives of the play. You're using me, said Ibrahim with the shadow of a smile. Emile was left in the care of Mariam's brother, Anis, who would convey him to his father's home on Saturday. The morning was fresh, and as we curved around the highest point of the suburb, I could see a bank of mist in the distance, a thick line of darker blue on the horizon, which resembled the sea. Mariam played Maria Callas quietly from her iPhone via Bluetooth. I, in the front passenger seat, ate a fig squashed inside a piece of bread, and Wa'al dozed in the seat behind me. Oh, said Ibrahim, shit. What, said Mariam. Ibrahim was looking at his phone. Two guards had been killed outside Al-Aqsa Mosque an hour ago. Oh my God, said Mariam. Who did it, I asked. Three Palestinians from inside. The Israelis are closing Al-Haram al-Sharif. Ay, 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 said Mariam. Be prepared for a long drive, guys. One foreign national with an Arab and potentially Palestinian name, two Palestinian citizens of Israel and one West Bank resident with a temporary permit sit in a car with yellow Israeli plates approaching a checkpoint. The line is sluggish. The soldiers are investigating every vehicle, regardless of the number plate color. Near the windowless tower, a shabby Israeli flag roils on the wind, looking not at all like those forlorn fraying Palestinian flags that once illegal, but now par for the course, adorn electricity pylons across Ramallah, but rather somehow eternal and careless, marks of the ragged outposts of empire. Part of the checkpoint itself is surrounded by scaffolding and the red plastic webbing around the base has broken down, the sticks of ports in the corners pointing at odd angles. A tap on the driver's window, a slender soldier bends over wearing a very large green hat like an upside down basket. He has blonde eyelashes. A typical rigmarole ensues of identification cards and passports conducted in Hebrew with the driver. Then the soldier points at the youngest of the men, the West Bank resident sitting in the back. Hebrew switches to Arabic. The soldier tells him to get out of the car. I have a permit, says the young man. He has a permit, repeats the woman driving. Another soldier appears on the other side of the car. He opens the rear door and orders the young man out. The threat has materialized so quickly, unspoken, that if he does not comply, they will force him out. 
Wael gets out. The soldiers escort him into the building at the checkpoint. As they are passing through the doorway, the blonde soldier taps him on the back of the head and Wael's shoulders flinch into an automatic hunch. It is as though the scene is playing on a roll of film from which this frame onward has been bleached. I was hardly aware of my body as I thrust my door open. I only knew my vision filled with white. And now I was outside and the morning air was cool on my face and hands. Propelled by an alien force, I marched over the uneven, untended terrain that preceded the checkpoint, the rubble and trash and random horizontal blocks of concrete towards another soldier now standing to attention with his gun ready. Dimly conscious that Mariam and Brahim were shouting at me from the car windows, come back, Sonia, come back. The crucial thought swooped through my mind that the soldier might suspect I had a knife, a suspicion I knew very well was grounds for shooting to kill. And although my ability to pass as a white woman might theoretically offer me some protection, I nevertheless dropped my pace and lifted my arms to make clear that my hands were empty. Rage was making me vibrate. Strangely, as I neared him, the soldier turned to one side as if to ignore me, except that his hands were on his weapon and he looked ready to use it. He was young, probably 18 or 19. Perhaps he didn't know how to respond to the situation, the approach of an apparently raving red-haired woman in white linen trousers and Converse sneakers. He spoke rapidly into his walkie-talkie. Oh God, what am I doing? I thought. And then I said loudly, where have you taken my son? My voice came from somewhere other than my mouth, somewhere further away. The soldier gave me a confused human look while the walkie-talkie, which he was holding by his face, emitted a stream of Hebrew. Your son? Where have you taken him? Get back in your car. In those four words, it became clear to me that he had a British accent. Where are you from? I asked. What? You're English. Show me your passport. I left it in the car. Go and get it. Are you from Manchester? Get me your passport, madam. What the hell are you doing here? What am I doing here? Our exchange was splashing quite far outside the normal waterways of this scenario, soldier, civilian, military checkpoint. I can't believe you're from Manchester. I'm not from Manchester, I'm from Leeds, said the soldier, and I'm here defending my people. Now get back in the car. Defending? Disdain and outrage made me spit the word, compounded, I suppose, by the fact that he was about half my age. I'm being serious. His voice was becoming gruffer, but I could see he was warning me. This being English had drawn an uncomfortable rope between us, to which he had already made an accidental concession by addressing me as though I were a human being. Backing down from that must have been a challenge. Possibly it required a certain level of training. If you don't cooperate, he said, they're going to be really tough on you. Now the blonde soldier, the one who had hit Wael on the back of the head, appeared from the booth. My exchange with the soldier from Leeds had affected me too, my rage was losing its purity as the reality of the scene impressed itself upon me. The jostling of the guns on their belts and their ready fingers jangling in my awareness, leeching me of courage. I'm not sure it even deserves the name of courage. It was more like a temporary lunacy from which I was starting to sober, the fog lifting. I wobbled over the trash back to the car, still trembling, but no longer from anger. The blonde soldier followed a few paces behind. This is ridiculous, I said very Englishly, avoiding Mariam's eye as she scrolled down the window. I watched my hand shaking, extended before me. Passport, I said. I was frightened of what would happen when they saw I was Arab. The soldier took it directly from Mariam's hand, bypassing mine. Get in the car, he said. I got in the car. We watched them lumber away in their bulky greens, walkie-talkies crackling. I'm sorry, I said. What the fuck was that, said Brahim. I didn't respond. A terrible fast lightness had taken over my body, like the wheeling of the wind around an empty fireplace. We waited about an hour. Cars passed us, were checked, went through. Here he comes, said Mariam. And there was Wael, and a soldier holding my passport and his ID. Once Wael was in the car, we drove off. I turned round on my seat. Are you all right? Did they do anything to you in there? Something cracked in my chest. Everything in Wael's face was slightly creased and he was unable to look at me directly. At the same time, he seemed not to know where to else to put his eye, so his eyes shifted back and forth, up and down like a dog's. I knew this look. I had seen it on the face of a defendant when I was doing jury's duty for a robbery case. The young man standing in the booth in white shirt and blue tie, hair combed and parted, listening to the verdict before an audience of strangers, lawyers and jurors. 
It was an expression of defeat and of shame. I have never seen this expression on a woman's face. We sat in silence the rest of the way. I tried not to think about Ibrahim and instead compared in a detached way my personal terror at being punished as a foreign national with Wael's very real position of risk. To relieve myself, I replayed the scene three or four times in my head, altering the ending each time until I had achieved a perfect fantasy in which Wael demonstrated to the soldiers who he was by standing there at the checkpoint, raising his arms and breaking into song. And that's it.